now and um, we can get started. But um, hi everyone, my name is Yossi Lifterman. I work for the Lenfest Institute. We're a Philadelphia-based nonprofit supporting local journalism and together with National Geographic Society and William Penn Foundation, we're supporting from the source, which is a, um, uh, was supposed to be a year long reporting initiative, but if you haven't heard, there's been a pandemic which has changed things a bit. Um, so it, it's extending a little bit longer, but uh, a year long reporting initiative covering the Delaware River watershed and, and how uh, the watershed uh, affects the people who live in it and, um, and its impacts on the environment and society and culture and, and things like that. And so I will drop in the chat a link to our shared website if you want to get a sense of the coverage, but we've been able to work with really great partners on this. And so I'd like to introduce Will Thompson, who is my colleague at the National Geographic Society to talk a bit about his role in the work National Geographic has done um, as part of the project. Yeah, thank you, Yossi. Um, so Nat Geo got involved because we're passionate about environmental journalism. And we were really eager to help prove this model of covering the watershed as a feat. Um, our goal in this initiative is to bring Nat Geo resources and approaches to this project's joint coverage. And some of the more concrete ways that we've been able to do this um, have been to bring in GIS mapping and more involved graphics to the watershed report. Um, so that's just a quick quick intro to, to what we've been up to on this project. And I'm actually just gonna quickly close uh, where I, I should have started, I think. And that's to say that there are two companies that make up National Geographic. There is our for-profit media company, which is the magazine and the television channel and our big Instagram uh, that everyone's familiar with. And then there's our, also our nonprofit um, that's been in operation since 1888. So through the non Graphic Society, we award a lot of grants that conduct impactful journalism, and we're also able to carry out really impactful programs like this one. Um, so I'm just gonna drop a few links in the chat right now. And first thing is, I really highly encourage everybody to check out nationalgeographic.org, and that is the .org and not the .com. And, uh, you know, really just take a few moments to check out the work that the Nat Geo Society does. And then the second is, uh, please check out our grants. And if you have any questions um, on our grants program at all, uh, feel free to reach out to either Yossi or I, Yossi can put you in touch, or feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, and I'll also just put my email in the chat real quick. Um, so this is our grants program that I, I highly encourage everyone to check out. And I'm just gonna put my email also right in the chat. And then uh, the last thing that I wanna mention is our emergency funding for COVID-19 reporting. So we started this fund to pivot a lot of our existing grants and programs to be able to fund journalists who were covering COVID in their own communities. Uh, with an aim to disseminate important information that further public safety and public health. Um, so far to date, since we were, we were able to get this fund together, we funded, I think, 132 projects out of this fund. Uh, and I believe in more than 50 countries. Um, so I'd highly encourage everybody to check out this fund as well. And I'm just gonna drop this in the chat as well. Uh, and again, with any questions or for any information, um, please feel free to reach out. And then I'm gonna turn it, turn it over. Awesome, thanks so much, Will. Um, I definitely encourage you to check out all the amazing stuff that National Geographic Society is working on. They do incredible work. Um, and the other amazing group we've gotten to partner with as part of this training specifically has been Earth Journalism Network, which um, Sarah is joining us and can tell you a bit about EJN and, and their work and how they support coverage of watersheds uh, around the world. Thank you, Yossi. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be partnering on this particular webinar uh, as, as a little bit of background on the Earth Journalism Network. We are part of a broader media uh, nonprofit called Internews, which has traditionally supported reporters in developing countries to look at um, 
some of the challenges facing the media. And our particular program has been around since 2004, in fact, um, and our focus has largely been on countries that are bearing most of the brunt of climate change. And so we've done a lot of work with places like um, South Asia um, and Eastern Africa and places that are really seeing um, the hardest impacts of climate change and other environmental abuse. And what's been interesting, I think, in more recent years is that people around the world are feeling those impacts now. And so this is a, a much broader global conversation we're starting to have. And um, EOC and I had a conversation about partnering on something like looking at watersheds because it is such a global issue now. And there's so many overlaps and similarities, I think, between the way that communities are affected um, that depend on watersheds and that live along watersheds all over the world. And so, and going through some of the, from the source stories, I was struck by how many of them really hang on these personal narratives and testimonies from people whose lives have been impacted by degradation happening along watersheds. And, and that's something that we've really worked with our journalists and our network to dive into is looking at how people are directly affected. And I think that that helps to create some relevance around these stories that we're forming and reporting. Um, another focus of ours has always been to try and hold government to account, which I've seen a lot of the stories from the source doing, just uh, showing how deeply some of the policies and other regulations along watersheds impact people. Uh, and the way that we do our work is similarly to Nat Geo, we provide journalists with grants. And so we help give them a little bit of money and resources to go out and do the reporting. And we found that such a huge impact for journalists, especially in times when um, smaller publications are finding themselves with fewer resources. And often freelancers are um, the reporters doing a lot of this work. And so we offer a little bit of seed money as well as um, training on particular issues. Uh, a lot of journalists who may not have ever covered environmental issues are finding themselves in a situation of needing to then really up their knowledge to know how to find the right sources, which Rona will certainly talk about during this presentation, and knowing kind of the, the deep understanding of, um, I think, the residual impacts of watersheds and what that means. So I wanted to just um, pull up one particular example that I think does a really good job of looking at the life of a watershed that we supported through um, one of our partners called the Third Pole. And um, much like Nat Geo, we help reporters with mapping and um, hoping everyone can see this with mapping and GIS data and being able to show really what um, what a watershed looks like and how that uh, looks to people that live along it. And so this particular story follows uh, a reporter and a photographer down the Koshi River, which starts in the Himalayas and goes all the way down through South Asia to deposit in um, coastal India. And it looks at how the river changes and um, how people are impacted along that and the different environmental impacts that they feel along the way. And this story generated a huge amount of attention and impact and feedback. And we found that um, policymakers were responding to it. People who really didn't know that much about this watershed started sending uh, messages to us and reaching out. And we, we were really, um, actually, I'm not sharing it, am I? Okay, there we are. Um, so as you can see, we do a lot of mapping. We sort of take people along this journey and I'll put a link to this story in the chat um, from the start of the river all the way down. And what was interesting about this, I think, is people just hadn't really thought about the deep impacts that these ecosystems have on the communities that live along it and that depend on it. Um, and I think really laying it out in this way gave people a great picture of what's happening and the ripple effects that something that's happening at the top of a watershed um, have on everyone else along the route. And so I know that that is 
something that from the source is really invested in and um, promoted. And we love to see that the, this type of reporting is being done at a very local level. Um, you know, we've always tried to connect that then to a broader global conversation. And we hope that um, some of the conversations that come out of today and that uh, maybe some of the knowledge and understanding that comes out of your reporting on the Delaware Rivershed can be part of a bigger conversation at some point with other reporters who focus on these issues um, and who look at environmental impacts. I think getting journalists to share their reporting and understand that what they're reporting on is happening in other places as well is really illuminating and helps um, create inspiration for how journalists go about reporting on these stories. So um, I will go ahead and turn it over to Rona. Um, but first, I'll give you a little bit of background on her. Um, as you saw probably from registration, she's a science editor and writer with Maryland Sea Grant. Uh, Rona is also an adjunct professor at the University of Maryland's Philip Merrill College of Journalism, uh, where she's getting her master's degree, focused on environmental history. She's been covering the Chesapeake Bay for 16 years, um, starting in the Baltimore Sun and then the Chesapeake Bay Journal. Uh, we were excited about her deep experience, but also for her to talk about her experience covering the Chesapeake and how that relates to other watersheds. And I think it'll be really interesting for all of you um, to hear her experience. And she's got a great presentation for us. I know she'll have some great tips and strategies on covering everything from regulatory impacts to economic and social issues confronting our watersheds. So Rona, I will let you take it away, but we're very glad to have you. And I'm really glad to see this conversation happening. Well, um, thank you very much. And um, it's great to be here. Um, I am going to attempt to share my screen so you can um, see my presentation. Let's see if that works. Um, here we go. Okay. Um, so it did work. <laughs> Yay. Um, and um, just to get into the mode that I want. Um, okay, so um, I, uh, I was very fortunate to kind of have environmental journalism find me. Um, I was a regional reporter at the Baltimore Sun uh, from 2000 to 2004. I'd kind of started my career probably the same way a lot of you did. I was a police reporter at night. I covered county government. I, I did all kinds of other things. And then I was a, a basically a bureau reporter and the bureau that I was in included a couple environmental hazards, including uh, two Superfund sites and multiple illegal dumping. Um, it was the north and west part of Anne Arundel County, which is where Annapolis is, but I was in the part not next to Annapolis. And so I had some familiarity with the Chesapeake Bay, but not actually that much. And so in 2004, the, um, the, the Baltimore Sun had at that time two environmental reporters and they didn't really divide it up. They both just covered the environment. But in 2004, they decided to split the jobs into one environment reporter and one Chesapeake Bay reporter. And the idea at the time was, um, they wanted fewer stories about reports and kind of the bureaucracy of the cleanup and more stories about the people. Um, as Sarah talked about, that's kind of the best way in, right, is a story about a people. And I had been writing a lot of features. Um, and so they, they gave me the position and told me, you know, to bring some life into the beat. So I, I did that, I think. But um, also, you still have to cover the day-to-day -day of how a watershed um, is cleaned up and what that looks like. And so I'm just going to go over kind of a few ways uh, that I kind of divided up the Chesapeake Bay watershed and, and how, how it looks. Um, hopefully this, again, this will work. So um, I hope you can all see this, um, the screen. Uh, okay, so here you see this complex web of government, of different groups and government agencies, advisory committees and work groups and teams. And this is the organization of the Chesapeake Bay Program, which is a multi-state, federal, and state cleanup program. Um, 
the Delaware River Basin Commission has probably a different structure, but it might be somewhat similar. Basically, the the upshot is it's a morass of government agencies that do different things at different times. And how do you figure out which ones you should cover, what's important to go to? Um, we have been fortunate in Chesapeake Bay to um, have kind of an open access. Um, the Chesapeake Bay program, it, it's moving because of flood regulations, but it used to be housed in a building in Eastport, and um, which is it, on the other side of Annapolis, on the other side of the river um, of Spa Creek. And you could just kind of walk around all the different offices. Um, and the meetings were in this building that we call the Fish Shack, which you could just access from any side. And you could attend pretty much any meeting anytime you wanted. Um, and they were all open to the public and not that many reporters would go. But if you went, you'd learn a lot. And so um, there, I think the open access in the Bay program is a bit unusual from what I'm hearing from other reporters, but it was a great way to sort of figure out what was happening and figure out which of these, which of these meetings you should go to. So we'll start with, you know, where does news happen? So for us, once a year, the Chesapeake Bay Executive Council meets. It includes the governors of all three states. Um, so it was earlier this week and Governor Wolf was there uh, as well as Governor Hogan um, and the, D the mayor of Washington. And so it sounds like a really important meeting. All these important people are there. So the question is, should you go? Well, you would probably think, yes, I should go because all these people are gonna be there. Well, guess what? They don't talk to you. So they close the door and they go into a meeting and then they come out and they issue a press statement. So, you know, you don't wanna waste your time and go all the way to Richmond or Harrisburg or Annapolis or DC from wherever you live to go to a meeting where you're not gonna get anything that you're not gonna get in a press release. I learned this the hard way the first time I went. Um, so you wanna find out, is there press availability? And if there is press availability, then maybe you go. And if there isn't, then you can tell your editors, you know what? they're not going to have this meeting out in the public. They're just going to issue a press statement. They're not gonna answer any questions. So, you know, do you think it's worth it for me to drive three hours to Richmond to hear this or, you know, not? Because sometimes the, the editor thinks, oh, the governor's there, you should go. And sometimes that is, that is the right decision. And sometimes it ends up being a frustrating waste of time, right? Okay, next. So there's something called the Chesapeake Bay Commission. And that meets four times a year. And it includes legislators from Maryland and Pennsylvania and Virginia. The fourth meeting is the meeting I mentioned before when the governors come. So it has a website with agendas. It lays out its themes of priorities, different bills they're gonna put out. They had one that they were doing on microbeads, another one to try to fence cows out of streams, um, how, how to do this. So should you go to their meetings is the question. Um, yes, <laughs> you should go to their meetings because it is a really good opportunity to talk. During the breaks, the senators, the state senators mill about and you can get to know them. These meetings usually last a couple of days. You can get tons of story ideas on these. And um, what I liked about covering them is um, a lot of times it's very hard to get access to people. They, they don't necessarily return your calls. Um, if, their, if their office is, is not super friendly to reporters, um, you know, you, you may not succeed in getting a quote or something you need. Um, sometimes you're calling about things they don't want to talk about, like their support of fracking um, that they know is controversial. So if, if you go to this meeting and you run into Senator Yaw or um, somebody else, um, you can often get them to talk. And then they may tell you about more stories. So I would come back from these quarterly meetings, usually with like, I don't know, seven or eight stories that I could do. So I say the more important meeting would be the one where the, where the um, lower level politicians tend to go than the higher level one where they really clamp down on access. Um, okay. Um, so following the science and the scoops, how do you do that on a watershed beat? Um, the Science and Technical Advisory Committee of the Chesapeake Bay, they usually meet also three or four times a year over two days. They have a special agenda. They invite guest speakers. 
Um, so that is a good way to kind of find out what, what science they care about. So what, like when the, the most recent meeting, I think they had a big, um, they issued a big report on microplastics. Microplastics is becoming a very big issue in the Chesapeake Bay right now. I am probably a week late on turning in my own microplastics story. Um, so this is a big issue. It's been a big issue nationally. It's now a big issue here. So if you go to the Science and Technical Advisory Committee meeting, that can be kind of a head start. It could be a daily story on, you know, they met yesterday and talked about X, but it can also be fodder for a bigger story on this issue is becoming really important to the Bay. This is why, this is where, um, and you can get a really good story out of, out of going to their meetings. Um, also really important to round out stories on the Bay Beat is the universities. Um, so I work now at Maryland Sea Grant, which is part of the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. And when, when I was a reporter, I would frequently call the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. And frequently, the president of the university, who was Don Bosch, who some of you have talked to over the years, um, he would take the calls. I had a cell phone. I could call him. He would talk. Um, I don't cover it anymore because I work there now. Um, so I'm not sure if the new president is quite as accessible to reporters. Um, but that's a great way, uh, say your state issues a new regulation on poultry manure and the state says you know this will be great this will streamline things um, this will re reduce regulatory burdens um, you can call the president of the university and have them sort of give you their take on it or if you call the um the um the communications person for the university of maryland center for environmental science which is probably where you should start she can point you to the correct scientist who will maybe contradict that or give you some context. It's extremely helpful when you're doing something like the regulation of blue crabs. Um, so they're always, you know, relaxing or tightening the regulations on blue crabs. And sometimes it's hard to tell um, if, it's, if it's a good thing or a bad thing or how much impact it will have. And so you talk to a scientist and he tells you like, well, if you catch a crab at this size, you lose this much reproduction than if you catch a crab at that size. And the state press release maybe didn't put that part in. So they're a really good resource. Um, typically, I think they are mostly unbiased and willing to, to speak about the facts. Um, not the case in every case. Um, some some are, have more industry funded research, but I found that it was a really important tool to round out the stories that I, that I was doing. Um, okay, so the next um, thing I wanted to talk about is you know how you find stories. One way is if you read the headlines, the environmental news headlines, you can localize a lot of stories. So, for example, oyster, ocean acidification is a huge problem in the Pacific Northwest. It's killing a lot of oysters. Uh, they just started uh, a lease program in Delaware Bay not too long ago, growing oysters. Is ocean acidification a concern? Um, it hasn't been a huge story in Chesapeake Bay, I'll be honest, but we have written about it because there have been studies to fund it, to look at it, um, to sort of examine, like, if it comes here, what will that look like? So that's a good way to kind of take a national trend and localize it. Um, same thing with the fracking ban. They put a fracking ban in New York. Um, what happens in Pennsylvania? Will that, will that translate to one there? Is there pressure? Um, what do things look like in New York? If you could, um, you know, get over the border, it shouldn't be too expensive to convince an editor to do that. Um, send you to New York for a day or so and look at what's going on there. Um, there's been an interesting story um, about mussels dying in Ohio and Kentucky. Um, I don't know if the mussels in the Delaware Bay are also suffering from the same consequences, but it would be a good story to try to find out. Um, um, striped bass regulations are really hurting Maryland charter boat captains. Is that happening elsewhere? Um, blue catfish invading the Potomac. Uh, where are they going next? You can always kind of look and see if what happens here is going to happen in Delaware or elsewhere in Pennsylvania. Um, things like the living shoreline law. Uh, there was a law in Virginia that strongly encouraged 
living shorelines. And uh, so it's changing the coast of Virginia. Um, could look at like, what is the data in terms of how much nitrogen and phosphorus has, have, have been reduced from this? Um, how much uh, lessening of wave action? Has it helped control flooding? Um, are other states considering similar laws? Those are just a few of the examples I could think of. Um, so sometimes we get stuck um, sort of with the state and um, they, they don't want to give us more information about a particular to topic. Um, maybe we filed a, a PIA and we haven't heard back. So who are you going to call? The river keepers. Um, they meet every month. Um, they can take you out on the river and show you uh, sites. Um, if you call them and ask them what they're, what they're up to, they will tell you. If you need more context about a development, um, sediment going into the river or um, a power plant emitting too much, too much chemicals or a permit that looks wonky, but you're not quite sure what's wrong with it, Call, them, call the river keepers and they will help you. Um, this is Fred Tutman. He is the river keeper of the Patuxent. He has helped me on many, many stories, um, more than I can count. Um, just a, a font of useful information um, about the river. He is constantly filing challenges to permits. Um, he has his hands in many pots from sort of uh, Boy Scout camping trips to suing power plants. And so there's a breadth of expertise that these guys have. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they are not, um, they, are, they are favorable towards reporters generally. Uh, they appreciate the press in ways that sometimes the state officials don't. Um, also very important to go fishing with as many watermen or fishers as they might call them um, as you can. This is Billy Rice. Uh, that's a muskrat I think he's got. Um, he is one of my favorite fishermen to go out with. He fishes on the Potomac. Um, a lot of times these guys have, and I say guys because most of them are men, um, they have their hands in a lot of pots, right? So he's a fisherman, but he also served for many years on the Tidal Fish Advisory Commission. So he knows a lot of the politicians. They know the regulations really well because they have to live with them, they can tell you, you know, what it means to re increase the size of a crab, like how much, how much economic benefit they're gonna get out of it versus um, what that might do to the future population of, of, the, of, of the resource. So um, there, are, there are some in every state um, that are excellent and, you know, they, they know in some cases uh, just as much as the scientists do, and they're out there essentially collecting data just by observing. Um, so they're great people to get to know. Um, recreational folks also very good to get to know. Um, recreational folks are a little bit different in that um, they, you know, this is their hobby. So they're, they are, they're invested in it in a different way than the people who make their living on it are, but no less passionate. Um, and a lot of times, you know, they're extremely observant about what's going on and they may go out kayaking and see a spill or a slick or something and then call, make a call and that may end up being what starts a story. Um, so just, just a few uh, photographs of um, some of the recreational folks. And actually this group of people, um, I'll go back a second. Um, uh, it's called the Upstream Alliance, and um, they would be probably a good group for for you all to get to know. They have they were they started in the Chesapeake Bay, but they've done a lot of trips in Delaware, and um, for a very small fee, they will take you out on a two or three day kayak trip, and you will see amazing things and learn a ton. Um, and again, like the the cost is pretty nominal, um, and they do this with teachers and superintendents and uh, the, the, the folks who run the um, Camden wastewater plant went on one. It's a pretty cool group of people. So, um, okay, moving on. Um, listening to the outside groups because sometimes they're on the inside. Um, a lot of people who work for the Department of Natural Resources uh, or the State Department of Wildlife and Game and Inland Fisheries, they're there because this has been their passion since they were a kid. So when they are not working at DNR, 
they are probably out birding, fishing, kayaking, hiking, you know, enjoying the outdoors. They may be able to tell you in an unofficial capacity when they, when they see something and they may be able to help you um, sort of working the side channels to try to get a story. Um, I'll give you an example. Maybe this is a, a good example to share. Um, so there was a fish kill in Middle River, Maryland, which is um, on the eastern side of Baltimore County. 100,000 100, fish died in a popular stream. Um, and I found out about it through a chef I know who lived by there and he fished and he used to cook a lot of um, invasive fish. It was kind of a, a bit of a gimmick where he would do like an eat the invasives dinner. And I got to know him and he called me and he was like, hey, there's this huge fish kill. And the state hadn't sent out any releases, no warnings, nothing. Um, and um, I went out there with him and saw that it was indeed a very large fish kill. Um, and a couple of days later, the state, you know, confirmed it and they sent someone out, but it, it was, it took time and it was the activists who kind of pushed it. And then through the reporting, got the state to kind of acknowledge that, yes, we have this issue. And then after they put out a press release that said 100,000 fish died, the remaining environmental reporters in Baltimore, of which there aren't many, but everybody wrote about it because it was a pretty big story. Um, um, state agencies are still required stops. So send your PIA requests there, get to know the PIOs. That's pretty straightforward. Um, I tend to not love to do public information act requests. I'll just be honest. I don't, I don't, I don't submit very many of them. Um, I know they work really well for a lot of reporters and I will submit them if I want emails or something really specific but I find I get most of my stories just by talking and cajoling and sort of convincing people to give me things. And because I've been doing this a long enough time, I think I've built up a trust where that works for me. I still do find that when you file a PIA, things sort of you know clam up a bit, um, but when you have to do it, you have to do it. Um, and it's good to kind of get to know the PIO before you file something so they know who you are and what you're doing. I just think it's helpful because that makes it less ever adversarial. Um, river commissions. Um, river commissions are, are great because they, um, they're they sort of quasi, they're regulatory, but they're kind of quasi-regulatory. And so um, sometimes I have found that they're freer to speak. Um, particularly when I was covering fracking, I found the Susquehanna River Basin Commission very helpful because um, they were regulating the quantity of the water that was released and not the quality and fracking affected both, but there were a lot of concerns about quality. And sometimes the, the River Basin Commission was alerted to those things and they were very frankly disgusted by you know, what was happening with the quality of the water. And sometimes they would tell me like, hey, did you know there's a spill? And I wouldn't have been told and the public wouldn't have been told, but the River Commission was told because of regulatory reasons they need to know these things. Um, also, River Commissions have a lot of employees, more than I would have thought. And there's kind of a revolving door. Um, a lot of the uh, Susquehanna River Basin Commission uh, employees uh, uh, rotated out to go work at the gas industry. Uh, sometimes they go work for other governmental agencies. So if you can find former employees, those are really, really good sources. Um, and the, la uh, the last of my 10 is um, the, the legal eagles. Um, we have here in Chesapeake Bay, we have something called the Chesapeake Legal Alliance. That's actually fairly new. It's a network of volunteer lawyers who um, will take on Chesapeake Bay cases. But many, many states, um, including I'm sure uh, the states of Delaware and Pennsylvania have environmental law groups that file lawsuits on behalf of the environment. Um, University of Maryland Environmental Law Clinic does it, Southern Environmental Law Center in Virginia does it, and they are very eager to talk about their case. It is helpful to them to talk in the media about their cases. So get to know them. Um, you know, if you're new on the beat, I would be surprised if one of these groups hasn't already contacted you to say hello and let you know what they're doing because they they are um, always eager to get coverage for their issues and they're really good resources to explain 
uh, if you have a question about something. I mean, the nice thing about, about these groups is, you know, they don't bill by the hour. And so if you really want to just chat for 45 minutes about, you know, ocean law, you can probably find someone at one of these groups who's going to help you just to understand things. Um, this is a photograph that I took a few years ago at the Severn River, um, right near BWI Airport, um, the highway that goes to the airport. Um, this is, you don't normally see this clarity in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, this is all underwater grasses, SAVs. So I say that the best stories are the ones that surprise you. Like you wouldn't expect to see grasses growing right by BWI Airport where there's tons of traffic and tons of impervious surface, but here it is. So that would be a fun story. I didn't actually do that story, but I could have and probably should have. <laughs> um, and, uh, but you know, things, things like that, you know, just like when you see something that doesn't fit, like um, at the same time of year, this was a really good year for the Bay. Um, I was, I was at the Inner Harbor doing something and the water was so clear, you could see crabs like scurrying around the bottom, which is, you know, something that we don't typically see here. And it was really cool. So things like that, a lot of times that, that might not like, that might not necessarily make a story for every newspaper, but for a daily, like, that's really cool. Like all of a sudden, you know, we saw a seahorse. That's, you know, that's awesome. So, um, I just wanted to add a couple things to the end of my presentation about um, diverse sources. Um, this is a really important thing um, that I would be remiss if I didn't address it. Um, the Chesapeake Bay watershed has 18 million people. It includes major cities, uh, Virginia, in Virginia, Richmond, Baltimore, Washington, DC, uh, Harrisburg, 64,000 miles from Cooperstown, New York to Virginia Beach. Um, people of color are 35% of the region, but they are just 14% of the people who work for or with the Bay Program. And among the Bay Program's leaders, like the, you know, the directors, um, it's more scarce. It's 9%. Um, and this information was in the Chesapeake Bay Journal, my former and beloved um, uh, former employer, uh, which I believe... Um, has an all-white staff, at least it did uh, when I worked there, and the person who replaced me was white. So um, we're dealing with an issue here um, that is probably not just unique to Chesapeake Bay in that um, the way we've covered the environment has been through a very white lens. Um, we talk about oysters, we talk about crabs, we talk about striped bass, we talk about nitrogen and phosphorus and farms, we don't really necessarily talk about asthma or about, you know, toxin, toxins coming out of smokestacks, um, some, uh, but I, I don't think enough. Um, and the connections need to be made. Um, so how do we find people who can, who are not going to just give us the same kind of uh, talk about about the same kind of things. You have to look, um, you have to push. And um, sometimes it means pushing the PIOs at the universities to deliver different scientists. If there's a guy who you've been talking to, you know, for two or three years um, and he's really good, it's hard to say, you know, oh, I've, I've loved talking to Bob, but you know, I, I've kind of noticed that most of my stories are, are white men heavy. Um, can, can, do you have someone else? Um, but I think you have to find some kind of a diplomatic way of kind of saying that. And um, just curious what you think, if anyone wants to take a read at some of the Chesapeake Bay stories in, in the news, Baltimore Sun or um, Bay Journal, and see if you can figure out why some of these, um, why some of this persists. And I'm happy to chat if anyone wants to email me about it. Um, but you can kind of see a pattern of what we cover. And just to say, like, you know, I, I, I did those things for a long time until I started to figure out that that wasn't really working for me anymore. But it took years of like, oh, wait, why do I keep writing these same things before I started to change? And about like four or five years ago, I think I started to really feel myself shift. Um, and so that like, you know, for a long time, I, I didn't do that. So, um, and these are just some of the stories that, um, I will, I have links to them and this presentation will be public so you can, um, you can 
uh, look at it, but um, there's a, this story I did about um, a, a, a trailer, it's basically a, a trailer park in, um, in, on the Patuxent River. Um, and I, I saw this park when I was doing a profile of the riverkeeper Fred Tutman. And um, I just, I saw it and I, I thought there has to be a story that I can do about this because it was, uh, it was it was in a really really bad state. They were failing septics, and it was a mess. Um, and the people who lived there were basically crying out for help. And the the county that it was in was really slow to respond. Um, the they couldn't seem to make the owner make repairs. And so I had to wait almost two years to write a story. I, I put some of the details in the profile of Fred, but the way our paper worked, we couldn't really write a story about a, a small local issue that didn't have like an overall Bay impact. So I had to wait and wait and wait. And finally what happened was the state bought Howling Point, um, but they paid $2 million for it and it wasn't worth that. And so that was the story I wrote. And I had to sort of convince my editors that it had to run because it was it was kind of a a, um, a conflicting story because on the one hand it was good that the state bought the property because that was the only way it was going to change but on the other hand like should the state be sort of you know being blackmailed essentially by people who refuse to do the basic uh, what's required of them under the codes to treat people decently and give them proper housing. And I kind of felt like we let this guy win by not forcing him to do what he was supposed to do. Um, but most of the people I talked to in the story said, you know what, yes, that's true. But the end result was uh, that it's better. So I did a story that was kind of, it was more of an essay really, um, but it is, it, it looked at those points, like how do we balance these two things? And I had to fight to get that story in the Bay Journal. They didn't want to run it because, you know, it didn't have like a, like a sort of a point necessarily, but I thought it was important to raise the issue. So um, I was glad we did. Um, even if at the end of the day, I came away thinking, well, yeah, it was probably worth it to grossly overpay for this property just so people aren't living like this anymore. Um, uh, okay, so I have also a story here about formerly incarcerated people who uh, are working in green jobs. And I just found this story by being out with somebody who ran a nonprofit in Baltimore. And we were out and we ran into one of his employees and he was a really nice guy. And um, when we said goodbye to him, the, the person who was the head of the organization said, oh, you know, um, we, we love working with him. And, you know, what's interesting is he just got out of prison. And it kind of made me think, I wonder how many people have gotten out of prison and, and gotten jobs planting trees or, you know, moving earth. And it turned out quite a few. Um, and so I was able to do a story because I found enough people, um, more than just the one. And of course, everybody who I talked to for the story had very interesting and harrowing tales of, of how they survived that didn't have anything to do with, with the environmental job they had now, but I tried to kind of work, work that in. Um, uh, a couple years ago, I did a film with some students at Morgan State, uh, and that, there's a link to the story and film here, but it's a story about climate change in a community on the Eastern shore where there are only three people who are still living there um, because everybody else moved because of flooding. And uh, that was a, a real pleasure to work on. Um, the next one on the list is just a story that I was reporting about grasses. And I realized kind of midway through the reporting that everybody I interviewed was a woman. And so then I was determined for all the photos to be of women. Um, and so it was, um, I think it was a first for our magazine that, you know, all the people interviewed were women, all the people um, in the photos were women. And all the people who edited and wrote and photographed and designed the story were women. So that was pretty exciting. Um, and then the last one on the list is uh, something I did recently. Again, it was sort of a thing that occurred to me that um, starting to see more and more women working in oyster hatcheries. Oyster farming is a very male dominated job um, in part because 
it requires immense strength to lift the cages and shake the cages and you know throw the cages over the boat and so there aren't a lot of women who do that work but increasingly there were a lot of women who grow the oysters in hatcheries from tiny seeds they breed uh, parent oysters from the bay called broodstock and they make the oysters and just over the last decade I've been covering oysters, it seems like more and more of the women started running hatcheries. And when I asked about it, I got a, oh yeah, I didn't realize that, but every, so I called every hatchery in Maryland and Virginia. And I basically asked, is there a woman in charge and can I talk to her? And for the most part, I think I talked to every, there was one, it was interesting because the, the one, the woman who actually inspired the story, I never could get to talk to her. Um, it was inspired by a, a guy named Tom Gallivan, who has an oyster farm called Shooting Point. And I was writing about him one time and he was like, you know, you really should talk to my wife. She's the story. And I thought, okay, you know, lots of people will say that their wife or husband does something interesting. And it turned out that she was the story <laughs> that she ran this hatchery. Um, and I never was able to talk to her, but I talked to all the other ones. So it's just a factor of kind of being out and, um, you know, talking and learning and listening. And then you find, you find a trend, like with the, with the incarcerated uh, men working the tree jobs or the women in hatcheries, you just, you start to think like, oh, there's, there's some, someone's doing that here. Could someone be doing that there? And it's a lot of legwork. It isn't press release you know, and make a phone call kind of work. But I find it to be more satisfying because um, nobody else had those stories. You know, nobody did the stories on this list. Um, other people have done a grass story, but I don't think anybody else did, did the stories that I have here. Um, people have done them since. Um, so it's not necessarily like you're, you're breaking news, but you're telling a part of the story that maybe um, wasn't known. So my last slide is, uh, this is me and my, my girls on Chincoteague. Um, and this is why I do what I do because um, they are really important to me. And um, I wanna make sure that we leave a legacy that's um, better than the way we found it. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, I am very happy to take any questions that you have. Um, amazing. Thank you so much, Rona. That was really amazing and thorough and great. And um, we already have one question coming in, but if you, anyone else has questions, feel free to drop it in the Q&A and I can um, turn your uh, voice on so you can ask it directly. So Adam, the first question is from Adam Glenn, um, which is uh, a little bit of a broader question, but Adam, I'll turn your, um, your Hi, voice. Hi, Adam. Feel free to ask away. <laughs> Is he un I, unmuted? I can ask to unmute. I'm unmuted. Uh, sorry about that. It took me a few seconds to catch up. Hi, Adam. <laughs> Hello. Uh, great to see you, Rona. And great um, presentation. Really enjoyed it. And the reason I asked the broader question, which is, um, uh, is there uh, are there good examples of this kind of bioregional based reporting um, elsewhere, uh, either? Uh, websites like From the Source, or initiatives like From the Source, or just individual journalists that any of the panelists are aware of who are kind of doing this prominently. And I ask, uh, just as an aside, because I edit um, uh, a weekly publication for the Society of Environmental Journalists, and I would love to bring this concept and uh, to, to that audience as well, working, other working uh, journalists. So, so I do have a, a motive there, but I'm mainly interested, is this... Um, a trend or is this kind of thing kind of an outlier where we see just a, only a handful of examples? Thanks, well, I'll mute again. Oh, <laughs> um, I think we've seen something kind of interesting, which is, um, uh, as, as you know, being part of SEJ, SEJ sort of used to be a lot of environment reporters for large newspapers, you know, like, uh, the Baltimore Sun, the Chicago Tribune, the Times Picayune, you know, they'd have one or two environmental reporters. A lot of them don't necessarily have one environmental reporter anymore. But I think what we've what we've seen is some very strong we continue to see strong reporting from the newspapers that have them. But we've seen, 
efforts. Like I, I think the Circle of Blue, where Brett Walton works, does a great job. Um, you know, sort of looking at things through a water lens. Um, the uh, New Orleans paper um, has this team of environmental reporters that are foundation funded, Sarah Smith and Tristan Barak, who just won the big SEJ award. I think they do terrific work. I mean, it's always great to win a big award for a big investigation, but day to day, I think they are doing a really good job, like covering uh, sea level rise and inundation. It's, it's very, it's great work. Um, I think we're seeing, um, in, in crisis situations like what we've got now in California, it's kind of an all hands on deck approach that, you know, the LA Times and the New York Times will put on, on, um, on big stories. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the smaller nonprofits like Civil Eats um, and uh, are doing phenomenal reporting. They're just doing it in places that maybe not everybody knows about. And so like it was easy, right? When there were, you know, 20 major newspapers and you know 20 major reporters and it was easy to keep track of everybody but now i feel like it's a broader world um and um and it's it's a bit um and you you're not necessarily finding that like all the local um environment reporting in the in the local newspapers sometimes it's it's elsewhere and if that I answers a couple other examples actually of that as well. Um, as part of this um, broader initiative, National Geographic Society and Lenfess Institute funded a, another watershed reporting project that wrapped up last year in the Ohio River watershed called um, Good River Stories of the Ohio. And it was a collaboration amongst six or seven nonprofit news organizations, basically spanning the length of that watershed from Pittsburgh all the way to um, Indiana. And so they produced a really great series uh, of stories as well, which I am dropping in the chat. Um, and one other news organization, actually, I'm gonna put her on the spot if she doesn't mind. So um, uh, Meg McGuire, who uh, is the founder of Delaware Currents, which covers the um, Delaware watershed in its scope, as well as a member of the From the Source Project. And I'm gonna um, promote her to a panelist right now. So I don't know. <laughs> If you want to add anything, um, feel free to. And let's get that. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, when I was rift, as we journalists know, many journalists who have been rift uh, reduction in force many years ago, I thought it'd be nice to be a freelance journalist and cover the Delaware River because it's about 20 minutes away from me. I was never particularly impressed with the Delaware River, I have to add. It looked basically <laughs> like a river, you know, little banks, little water. Eee. Um, once I got started, I was overwhelmed by the amount of stories that exist in a river and its watershed and understanding that in order for our lives around the river to be successful you begin to see the river that works almost like a machine i mean not that it's a machine but it's okay. how much water we take out what sort of stuff we put in what is the water quality what is the water quantity is there too much water is there too little water and all of the enormous ripple effects that those things have on people um, <clears throat> Delaware Currents is not for profit. Boy, is it a not for profit. Um, <laughs> it does get grants from time to time. Lenfest has occasionally given me money. Um, the understanding of a river's watershed is somehow very hard for people. Um, the Delaware has had a really bad reputation for like, hmm like back to colonial times when they were dumping all their raw sewage in the river and also all the refuse from the tanning operations and all of the industrial revolution crap. Uh, human sewage was in the river. Um, the industrial revolution came along, coal leavings were in the river. And so most people turned their back on the Delaware. In the last 50 years, the Delaware River Basin Commission existed before the Clean Water Act and the Clean Water Act have both together made a huge difference in the river. And now people are starting to appreciate it again, but they tend to appreciate it in a very narrow sense. Mm -hmm. um, if they kayak, they really like kayaking wherever they like to kayak. They don't really understand that some places it's good to kayak and some places it's not good. Uh, 
And just because the river doesn't smell as bad as it did 50 years ago doesn't mean that we shouldn't be careful of whereabouts in the river we put our bodies. So there's all sorts of issues that tumble around. And all of them relate to different aspects of the river in different parts of the river, but they all affect each other. And I'm sure Rona, with your incredible expertise in the Chesapeake, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And this sense of interconnectedness is such a great metaphor for all things environmental. You know, a smokestack yeah. in Ohio affects the residents in New York. You know, it's like we are in this together. And one of the reasons why I decided to do the work that I'm doing for the Delaware is because it seemed to me that certainly when I started about five years ago, we were sensitive to the polar bears, which is cool. I want the polar bears to survive. We might even be sensitive to the destruction of the Amazonian rainforest. Again, very important. But it was all sort of high level and away. And I think that if we can, if we can understand our unique ecosystems that we live in and are affected by, our understanding and commitment to how those ecosystems then link up with each other is enormously enhanced. So there we go, more than you bargained for, but there you go. <laughs> if I can just add one thing, since you mentioned the Delaware and the fetid state of the Delaware, you know, years and years ago. So I did a story not too long ago about a water treatment plan in Chester County. And um, when they started, um, when they, when they started, um, they were planning on putting the water treatment plant on the Delaware, but they were like, oh no, the Delaware is filthy. We can't do that. So they, they flooded a bunch of farms and they created something called Octoraro Creek. And when you go out to the Octoraro Creek, it looks beautiful. It's all farms. It's all Amish. So now the Octoraro Creek, which put itself, the, the water plant, which put itself out there to be in the bucolic you know, farms, of Chester County, right on the border of Lancaster, now it's being polluted by manure from the Amish farms. <laughs> so they're like, okay, plan B, we'll get our water from the Susquehanna, we'll blend it. Well, not like the Susquehanna doesn't have its own environmental problems, right. but it's sort of like, it made me think like, if only you had waited a, f a few decades, you know, you might, you might have been able to get your water from the Delaware and then you might not have to deal with all these issues that you have. Exactly. But exactly. It also, it's also telling that, you know, you look at something and you see, you look at the Octoraro and you would assume that the water there has got to be clean because it's just all bucolic farms. And if you're an environmental reporter, you know very differently that the water could be worse there than it is in, in urban Philadelphia. It just depends on, you know, what's going in. Um, it's not always what you expect. Right, exactly. And uh, there are a lot of the um, sewage treatment plants that get overwhelmed because a lot of them have the combined sewer overflow. Mm -hmm. And so you might be able to swim in this piece of the river when there hasn't been a storm, but you want to yeah. not swim in that river when there's been a storm because all of the storm water that rushes down the streets and alleys of our cities, especially true in urban areas, overwhelm the sewage treatment plant. And so some of the raw sewage ends up in the river again. This is yeah. not to say, and it's a hard, this is, <laughs> I'm sure you find this. Yeah. This is a hard thing to sort of like say it is both clean and not clean. Yeah. Basically people want to know, oh, it's clean. It's good to swim. Good. I'm done. No, it's, you <laughs> have to be thoughtful. Right, you know, right, you have yeah. to know, you know, so yeah, it gets to be a really dynamic conversation that you have to have with people about our environmental resources, I think. Definitely. My neighbor wants to go kayaking and I was like, great, when do you want to go? And she said, we should go after a really big rain. I'm like, no, no, we shouldn't. No, we shouldn't. Yes, that's very true. <laughs> um, well, terrific. Thanks so much, Meg. I will uh, turn your video back off so you can go back to being a participant if you'd like. Um, but uh, another question came in from Jesenia de Moya Carrera at the Philadelphia Inquirer, and she wanted to know, Thank you, Rona. I appreciate that you have been able to include more female voices into your reporting. How have things been in terms of diversifying or adding more voices of color to your reporting? Um, that's a great question. So for the for the Smithville story, um, that was an, I should have mentioned that's an African American community um, on the Eastern Shore. Um, so that was, uh, and we worked with the Morgan State students um, and. Um, Fred Tutman is, is the only Black River Keeper in the Chesapeake, and I talk to him a lot, but I, 
I, I, I, I am, I don't like to go back to the same people all the time because I feel like you don't want to sort of tokenize people and make them feel like they have to be the spokesperson for both the river and, you know, being the black water keeper. So um, I've tried really hard to diversify my sources. And one really easy and good way to do it is to reach out to the HBCUs. Um, I know when I had my slide of of all of the um, universities and you know who to call. I didn't specifically call out the um, the HBCUs. Um, the ones in my area don't have marine science, but they have engineering. Um, and Morgan State is a is a university that I call on when I when I want to do a story about engineering. Another huge resource for me uh, in diversifying my sources has been the University of Maryland Eastern Shore which is a fantastic place to do stories. It is a HBCU. Uh, I think its population is maybe 55 to 60% black. It has a lot of uh, foreign students. A lot of students come from Kenya and Nigeria. And um, I love it because they focus on agriculture and on practices to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus which is really different than like a lot of the other things that people are doing, you know, looking at fish stomachs and seeing what's inside. I think um, I've gotten to know of a few of the scientists there and they're, they've become kind of my go-tos when I, when I do agriculture stories. Um, so um, I have to say like, I, I didn't, as I said in the presentation, I didn't think about it for, a long time in in the right way. I don't think like I always was attracted to stories that involve people of color doing things. But I sort of in my mind was like, oh, here's a feature on a person of color or a woman doing this or that. And um, now I think of it as, oh, okay, I have to do a story in microplastics. Who can I talk to for this story? Who is a person of color? Like instead, like taking my regular stories and incorporating diverse sources into them as opposed to just seeking out, um, you know, diver like it's great that we did the story on Smithville and it's great that we did a film on Smithville, but the next time I do a story on sea level rise and, and climate change, like I want to talk to a black scientist. I want to talk to a scientist of color. I want to talk to somebody who looks at wetlands and how they move. Um, and I, I the, it's hard to do that. Um, because they don't necessarily immediately present themselves, but they're out there. You just have to look a little harder. And I think for me, it's a continuing, um, it's a continuing effort. Um, excellent. Thank you so much for a really great question and an excellent answer. And we, um, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to to drop them um, in the the Q and A or. Um, drop them in the chat and we're happy to to get to them but sort of building on that that last question rona i was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the new project you're starting in baltimore that sort of answer sort of tries to address some of these questions as well uh sure so a couple of friends and and i a friends of mine and i have kind of started a, a nonprofit environmental journalism group uh we're calling it the in, environmental Journalism Justice Initiative hyphen Baltimore because we're hoping that it will catch on in other cities once we get it started. And what we're what we'd like to do is get an environmental journalism curriculum going in a Baltimore high school. Um, we've identified a school and we're working with them to make this happen. Um, so uh, my friend um, is going to be the executive director of it, and we have. We are pretty close to getting funding for him to, to kind of do it full time. Um, and uh, then the other person we want to hire is a filmmaker who I worked with on the Smithville project who recently graduated from Morgan State. So if we get it going, it will be it will it will basically be a, a, a black journalist run organization. Um, I will continue to be part of it, um, you know, advising and working on the curriculum, but it's not my plan um, to to, to get pay for it. Um, and I think it's, it was important to us that it be run by people who live in the city and who are suffering from these consequences. Um, we felt like that would be the best way to, um, 
communicate the problem. So um, yeah, we're working on it. It's my it's my side side project, <laughs> um, uh, and um, yeah, it's it's coming along really well. And everybody, including the people at my university, have been very supportive of the idea and of eventually me like contributing time to it. Terrific, thank you. I, I live in Baltimore, so I am yeah. <laughs> interested by that project and excited to see the work that comes out of it. Um, our next question comes from Don Stolzfus, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name. She says, hello to my old pal Rona. Can you talk about how you communicate complex wonky rules and regulations and still keep readers interested and engaged? Um, that's a great question. Hi, Don. Thank you. Um, I mostly do it, as Sarah said, through people, you know, through, I was just before we came on, I was reading my New Yorker, um, and uh, there's an article about milk prices, which is, you know, a very nerdy thing to, to be fascinated by, but I am very fascinated by it. And the story, uh, which is written by someone named Dan Kaufman, who I wasn't familiar with, he starts the story by talking about this one farmer um, who has, um, I think Croatian roots and he, you know, when he came to Wisconsin and how long he's farmed and how many cows he has, and, you know, how the Trump tariffs have affected him. And then like we're two pages in and then he explains how milk prices work. So you're already kind of invested in the character before you get to the complex like uh, wonky stuff. And so I think you use people as much as you can. And, you know, this is how this affects my life, um, you know, Don's worked with me on a lot of stories about, you know, very wonky things like, um, uh, you know, putting manure on frozen ground or, you know, um, different like uh, regulations on how much manure you can put down and when and um, uh, different like uh, flush fees. And so you have to just, um, you have to really explain how this affects people's lives and you have to get them to care about, um, we always talk about, especially like trying to engage Pennsylvania in Chesapeake Bay, um, because a chunk of our watershed is Pennsylvania and they don't have much of a relationship to the Bay. You try to get people to engage with the stream where they live. And, you know, I live in the suburb of Baltimore and my stream is, oh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's overgrown, you know, nobody goes down there. It's not a place you swim. Uh, so to try to get people engaged to care about that is 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 hard, but that's like you try to get them to see, you know, the effects of whatever it is where they live, and then they can sort of connect. You know, oh, okay, well, if we if we don't, you know, do a flush fee, like um, this piece that I love is going to get overwhelmed with you know pollution, and so you try to connect it because unfortunately there's a lot of misinformation and it's hard for the, you know, the voices of reason to counteract that. It's a very big challenge and a frustrating one. Um, so if anyone else has questions, feel free to, to drop them in the q and I'll ask one because I am curious. One of the things I thought was so interesting about your presentation was the mention that there's sort of that overlap between folks who work in official capacities versus, and they're also interested in advocates for the river as well. And do those interests sometimes conflict or sort of, how do you sort of center those stories and those competing interests, I suppose? Well, the birth of the cell phone has been awesome for that um, because people, you know, officially on their work phone, they say whatever, and then they text you and they say something different. You know, um, I understand in Maryland, we have had, um, um, we had Democratic governors and then we had Governor Ehrlich from 2002 to 2006. And then we had Governor O'Malley and now we have had a Governor Hogan. And, um, you know, during, during the Ehrlich administration in particular, um, it was very difficult for, um, it was very difficult for officials within the Department of Natural Resources to speak freely about a variety of subjects, namely this, this sort of nutty plan to put a reproducing population of area Kansas Asian oysters into the bay. And so I found that, you know, they were, I had only really started on the beat at that point, but I quickly developed personal relationships with people and they would, they would, you know, you know, if you're discreet, you don't, you don't meet in the office, um, you know, you meet 
at a, an oyster bar in, you know, Baltimore and <laughs> um, you talk. I mean, I, I think, yes, it is, it is a conflict um, because people have to keep their jobs, especially state jobs. I mean, at the age that I am, my peers who work in state government are close, like five, seven years from retirement and you don't want to jeopardize that, right? So you have to sort of ride out whatever bad thing is happening until, until you're, until the administration changes or you're free again. And I can't really say, um, I've had a few things that I have covered, like a woman who got fired. Um, that was a big story for me. She was the crab manager and she got fired, uh, basically because the waterman wanted her fired. Um, there was no sort of basis for that other than that. Um, but um, some people have, have found it difficult to operate under the current administration and some people have not. Um, when I covered Ehrlich, it was much more unanimous that it was difficult. Um, so, and he put people in, in positions um, that, that made it very difficult. So um, Hogan has not done that. Uh, I think he's been very strategic and smart about the people that he's that he's put in agencies and at least I never um I have not I don't exactly have a conventional reporting job now because I actually work for the state and the university but when I was with the Bay Journal and I would call um I, I generally did not have a, a problem getting a hold of people I understand that other reporters did um had had some struggles um for my experience you know Hogan was much sent a much different tone than Ehrlich did. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there's, there's also, the, there's a chain of command. I mean, I'm still a journalist. And so, you know, you're supposed to go through your public information officer to speak to me. And so if, if um, you're speaking to me um, and you're not supposed to, like that could, you could be in trouble. So just try to be discreet about all of my mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> side chats yeah absolutely like uh ties it nicely like that's what you want to do with any beat i suppose so it ties together how to cover the watershed as a beat um does anyone else have any questions or comments feel free to drop them in the q a in, in the chat we can leave it open for another minute or two will or sarah i don't know if you have any other questions or comments but if not we can um leave it there i don't know rona if you have any closing thoughts or, or anything like that as well I just want to say thank you to everybody for your interest in this beat. Um, I think this is like the, the best beat at the paper. Um, uh, it's so varied. Instead of just covering courts or uh, schools, you get to cover such a breadth of issues. Um, you can really make every beat your beat when you cover the watershed. Um, I tried to have a balance between like the news, the investigations and the fun stuff. Um, one of the first stories I did um, was about um, a, a league of teenagers that swim in the Severn River. They put ropes up and they swim and I went to their swim practices and it was just fun like to, to see that. And that was a, you know, a good story to do. Um, and I did one more recently about um, sort of reprising that um, of a swim league in the Magathy, uh, people swimming. This was a story about dangerous bacteria. So I thought, why don't we start with people swimming? Um, so um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, try to have a good time, like try to make the stories fun and engaging and um, try not to get too sort of bogged down in the bureaucracy of the beat. Because I mean, if I wanted to, all I would do is go to meetings, like, and I, I didn't want to, so I didn't. Um, and there's, there's a lot of, every opportunity you can take to get on a boat, take it. Um, if you get seasick, uh, you know, there's these bands. Um, if it's really bad, maybe maybe think about, you know, um, I don't know, Dramamine or something or switching beats. <laughs> um, but um, uh, I loved being on boats. I loved like every opportunity I would, I could take to get out in the woods. I did. Um, I miss that a lot in my new job because I, I don't, do that as much anymore um, but uh, also if you might see if um, 
the river keeper will take you uh will take you out if there's i know like in in, in the anacostia river in dc i was going to do this with my journalism students but we couldn't because of the pandemic the anacostia river will take groups of i think 25 on its boat for free and they'll give you a lesson about the river um all you have to do is reserve it in advance so um if you can find a resource like that in philadelphia or delaware just just for fun just to go out and learn some stuff um i took my kids on the baltimore water taxi last week um because our our uh, white water rafting trip got canceled and it was just just to be out there on the boat looking at the harbor was just like i started getting all these ideas of you know different stories i could do um it's just it helps to just get out of your office, um, assuming you still have offices um, <laughs> and the newspapers haven't closed them, just get out. I mean, it, it's good for your mental health too, just to, you know, be outside um, and, and be talking to people who are, who love to be outside too, I guess. Excellent. Um, well, thank you so much. I think that's a great place to leave it. Um, we will share a recording of this conversation. We will share Rona's slides as well as sort of some notes and key takeaways next week. So keep an eye out from that in your emails and we'll publish them also at fromthesource.org. Um, I really wanted to thank Sarah and Will for um, joining us and especially to Rona for a really uh, outstanding uh, presentation. So we hope this is the, the start of an ongoing conversation and looking forward to, to sharing the resources more broadly, and we hope you uh, all have a, a nice weekend. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Bye. Take care, everybody. Thank you.